Good, so this is a theory session. We'll be doing obviously lots of activity sessions, but it's good to have a little bit of theory. Uh, are you recording? Mm -hmm. Oh, already, okay. Hi, future people on the internet in spandex. Um, so, this session is on decadence and nature. So we're in a nature connection retreat. The context here, the context, this is the wider context of how we're connecting to nature. So the next kind of 30 minutes, you'll figure out why we're disconnected from nature, some of the problems we have connecting with nature, some of the surrounding issues around that, why we need it, why it's difficult, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Even the fact that we have a word, nature and not nature. So yesterday I was talking about the word work and play, right? There's things we get paid for and things we don't. Yeah, even the fact that we have this word, nature, is kind of interesting, because what's not nature? Right? Like I was just teaching at CERN, like everything's made of atoms, everything's nature, that's the natural world they study, but we have a, a distinction. So like in this room, what's the most natural and least natural thing? Actually, just point, what's the most natural thing? Someone's pointing to their brain, someone's pointing to their body, someone's pointing out the window. Fla oh, flower? Flower is the most natural, not you. This flower is the most natural. Why? That's been cut. That's actually the, that's the reproductive organs of, a, of an organism. We've just cut, it's like cutting off the cock of something and sticking it there. Yeah. Why is that less? Nat why is that more natural than that? Or that. You see what I mean? It's just thinking a bit, a bit more about it. What's the least natural thing in here? The diet coke in my belly. <laughs> the, the, the phone. The, how about how about this? The the not yet born people watching this on the internet in seventy years time. <laughs> Whoa! How's the future? Did we fuck it up? Uh, okay. So what are we gonna look at? Decadence. So definition of decadence. Very simple. Uh, historians study this. Very normal. And study history. Societies rise and fall. Uh, decadence comes from descend, the falling part. Basically, civilizations can be thought of as having three stages. They have a sort of vigorous stage where they're uh, powerful and kind of invading the world. Uh, they have a sort of more civilized stage where they have an ethos. So it's not just power, it's not just invasion. They have some sort of philosophy of what is virtuous, what is correct, what is uh, good. Philosophy of goodness or philosophy of truth. And they pursue beauty, not just power. That's a civilization in its uh, apex, you could say. Yep. Uh, and then they descend. When they descend, historians agree they have a number of common features. Have a number of common features that we'll see that I'll go through, and these relate strongly to nature. So yeah, I'll go through those three stages again in relation to nature. So it's not really controversial. Um, what's interesting is we live in a civilization uh, which doesn't see itself as a civilization, and this there can be the invisibility. So if you're a Roman or an Aztec or a Persian. It's clear you're a Roman or an Aztec or a Persian, right? If we look at histories of civilizations, they rise and fall. For some reason, the, the West, and we could look at Western civilization, and then within that, you know, French civilization, for example, right? So it's not, it's not neatly boundary. Uh, the West tends to see itself in two ways. One is not a civilization. It doesn't see itself as having an ethos, which is strange because other people do. Yeah, like Japanese people talk about in the West. Right? Because that's uh, very Western. <coughs> Chinese people will do that. So other people see us as a civilization, but for some reason we don't ourselves. Um, the other one is in the West, there's an idea of progress. So this is an implicit idea in the West of linear progression. So we go from somewhere to somewhere else. Actually, unless you're Hebrew, it would be this way around for you. Yeah? It's usually left to right. Okay? Yeah, I did that very thing. So that idea means we tend not to see life cyclically. So the Indians, for example, would say, you know, civilizations exist in cycles. And by, they, by the way, they say we're in a decadent period. I think they call it the Kali Yuga. So Indian civilizations, Buddhists, Hindus would say we're in cycles. The Chinese would definitely see us, you know, in cycles. They understand these kind of cycles. You may have heard uh, this kind of, see this meme, this phrase, what do good times create? What do good times create? When everything's luxurious and easy and good. Weak man. Weak, let, let's make it non-gendered, because this, this is basically Germany, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> it's weak people. Okay, what do weak people create? Easy times. No, 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 weak people don't create. Oh, hard, bad times, hard times, or hard times. Hard times. Yeah. What do hard times create? 
Strong people. What do strong people create? Good times. Good times. Then it goes around again. Does it make sense? So someone was just saying to me in the break that they live in the sort of very rich area of Switzerland and Germany and Austria, where it's called, what's it called? Fly right. It's Lake of Constance. Lake of Constance, right? And it's very wealthy and it's very beautiful. And my guess, I've never been there, but here's my guess. People are obsessed with bullshit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, on the other hand, we have people from the Ukraine here. So there's nothing less decadent than a war. You're not interested in nonsense in a war. You're interested in survival. And it's a hard time. Right, so it's, it's you know being forced back into a hard time. And people act differently when there's a war. People are not so interested in nonsense. Yeah, people are not obsessed with things that are comfy. Okay, so does that uh, the definition of decadence make sense? At this period of a falling civilization, critically, it's not just falling; it actually becomes self-destructive. So this is there's a word called oikophobia. This is the idea of self-hatred, and you saw this with the Romans, you saw this with the Greeks, you saw this with the Persians. They become very cynical. Cynicism is a common sign of decadence. Yeah. Uh, the other thing you see is fragility. So think of this in regard to nature, right? Can you imagine your ancestors, and we're only talking a few generations ago, almost certainly they were tougher than you. Yeah, they were stronger than you. They had a different relationship to nature. My granddad was a fisherman in the Irish Sea. He's outside in all kinds of crazy weather. You know, people, his friends are drowning. You know, he became a sailor in World War II, which is a pretty dangerous job. Some of your ancestors were trying to kill him in submarines all day long. Right? That, like, my ancestors and your ancestors were killing each other two generations ago. It's not so long ago. Right? Like murdering each other. Yeah? Just en masse. And even without war, people were still, you know, imagine, anyone done farm work? See these hands? I used to do farm work as a kid. Farm work is hard. It's hard with machines. I used to be outside in all weathers, my hands would bleed. I, I still have wrinkles on my hand. This is from um, packing bags of onions. And we used to pack them by the ton. Yeah, so we'd take a 25 kilogram bag of onions, poof, pick it up from over here, put it over here, and we'd stack them until it was this high, and it was a ton, and then a forklift truck would come and take the onions away. That's hard work. Yeah? After that, I was like, fuck it, I'm going to be a psychologist. This is, ridiculous. <laughs> this is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, and I still have the wrinkles on my hands. This is from the onion sacks. Yeah, this is where the glove didn't quite reach my shirt. Yeah? So it's like, that's just from a few summers. Like, I did nothing compared to a lifetime. And I was on an industrial farm, which is much easier than, like, a, you know, my granddad on a fishing boat in, you know, whatever, 1935. Yeah? So it's um, that connection to the land and to nature in. A less decadent society is there. Less decadent societies tend to be less urban. Yes, yeah, so there's less people living in cities. Uh, they tend to be uh, more in contact with farming. Uh, people of like, how many of the things you eat have you killed? Like, who's killed a cow? Who's killed a rabbit? Who's killed a, you know, whatever the fuck you eat? Pig. There's a disconnection, right? There's a disconnection from the natural cycles there. Yeah? Uh, decadent cultures, so they become fragile. And the key thing in decadent cultures is they're disconnected. So they're disconnected from the body, they're disconnected from community, they're disconnected from meaning, and they're disconnected from nature. As we've already seen on this retreat, these four disconnections go together. So if you're living a cerebral, academic, urban life, you're very much likely to be less in contact with your body. Yeah? Equally, if you're part of a society that doesn't have a common belief system, a cynical society, like I was teaching this in Belgium, I said, who would die for Belgium? And everyone just laughed. <laughs> like, they're like, what the fuck? What, what's Belgium mean? You know, like, Belgium is nothing. You know, they were like, fuck off. But it, interesting, I also went to the Palais de Justice, the ju uh, justice courts in Belgium. You know, they won't be, it's a beautiful building. It's magnificent. And this beautiful lawyer showed me a mirror around. He took time out of his day, and he was proud of these buildings, and he was proud of what it represented. And he said, look, it's not perfect. And, Legal system is not perfect. There's always imperfection, right? It's like, you know, does Western culture have great rights for women? Yes, better than any culture in human history ever. If you don't believe me, go live in Saudi Arabia. Like, literally, we have the best rights for women that's ever existed in any culture in human history, unless we have fantasy ones or maybe some obscure island in the Pacific that isn't really real, but you've idealized in some hidden textbook or anthropology. Yeah? Like, we have, this is the best place to be a woman. Tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, like if I had a machine that could take you anywhere in human history as a woman, where are you setting the dial to? 
maybe Genghis Khan, maybe the Aztecs. Nowhere, right? You're like, I'm fine in Austria. <laughs> yeah, like I'm staying. But it doesn't mean it's perfect, but it means that there's been some achievement. There's been some serious achievement there, yeah? Okay, so back to decadence. Um, disconnection from self, from body, things become increasingly cerebral. Yeah, become increasingly, you hear this term now, I identify as. Yeah, let's, let's look at what's the synonym for identify? It's think. It's I think I am or I have some felt sense, right? But it's not about the body. It's the opposite of that. It's like, this is my body, but this is what I am, and that's not connected to my body. This doesn't mean we should start being mean to people or unkind to people. This doesn't mean we can't be in a you know, diverse world or different ways of being, but the body matters. It's not nothing. Yeah. Oh, everyone's got a bit uncomfortable. You okay? Am I, am I breaking a taboo? The, the taboo of decadence is anyone can think they're whatever they want. That's the taboo, right? Like, I can just think in my hand. It doesn't matter about the body. Yeah, like when someone says, um, I'm an X in a Y body, whatever that is, that's completely Descartian. It's, I'm a little mind that's totally separate from the body, therefore I can be in a body. Yeah, that's not an embodied perspective. If you want to take that perspective, you're welcome. Philosophically, that's Descartes. Yeah, it's not a non embodied perspective. So we have a disconnection from the body. We also have a disconnection from spirit. Why? Because in decadence, no one believes in anything. Yeah? Like people believe in things in culture. The Aztecs had a strong belief in their own culture, even if it was very strange to us. Uh, the Japanese had a belief in their culture. You know, say, well, we're from, descended from the sun god, and you know, this is our, our values, this is our way of being. Like what, what does the West believe in? We don't have a shared religion. Some of you are from the Czech Republic. It's the most secular country that's ever been recorded. It's the least religious country that's ever been recorded, and it drinks the most alcohol of any country that's ever been recorded. Maybe these things aren't disconnected. Yeah. So when there's no meaning, people try and cope. How do they cope? How do you think people cope in a decadent society? Because even without meaning, there's always suffering, right? Like who, who here has had a life free from tragedy? Some 25 year old might put their hand up. Anyone over 30 who's had a life free from tragedy? Not lost a loved one, not, you know, I had a cousin who killed himself when I was a kid, I had a best friend. You know, you've lost, 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 who's lost a parent? Like, that's the best tragedy you can have. It's way better than losing a kid, right? It's the best case scenario, this tragedy. Yeah, best case scenario. So given the fact that life does involve tragedy and suffering, we have to deal with it. So if we don't have a meaning system, if we don't have a belief system, if we don't have a coherent community around that system, what do we do? Yeah. Distraction. Again? Distraction. Distraction, yes, that's on the list. Distraction, number three. Okay. Yeah, we just go, you know what? Uh, life is suffering, I'm gonna die, but, but what's on TV? <laughs> You know what it is? There's always that feeling of like, I need a, 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 and also we habituate to it, to it, so it has to get more and more. Like, I remember films when I was a kid. God, I sound old. I remember films when I was a kid. If there was like a gunfight, it was a big deal. I remember watching Seven, that Brad Pitt film, and everyone said it's really extreme and disgusting. I watched it again last year. I was like, no, it's nothing. Oh, there's a head in the box. Okay, whatever. Like, things have got way more extreme in terms of uh, the distraction level of entertainment, right? Like, way more violent, way more chaotic. You know, every, there's a new shot every three seconds on something to keep your mind active. Don't feel, don't think about life, keep watching Netflix. Distraction. What else have we got? Buying things. Buying things. Okay, yes, yeah, so we've got consumer, can I add that to my list actually? Consumer culture. So it's materialism. So if we're not satisfied by our connection to self, to spirit, to community, to nature, back to our theme, we need something which is a, a, a substitute. Yeah? So materialism is this philosophy of more. Okay, that could be more stuff. Uh, now, most of you motherfuckers are middle class, so you've got another kind of materialism. All right, bad, and you're like, I'm above buying things. I only have one pair of jeans. You know, yours is probably experiential. Like, who loves to travel? Who loves to read? Okay, it's more. It's the same thing. More stuff. Your stuff is just 
slightly more refined stuff. <laughs> okay, your stuff is like, well, I did a meditation retreat in Bali. Your stuff is, I took uh, the ayahuasca with shamans in Brazil. That's still stuff, it's just not material. It's materialism on the level of experience. Yeah, it's not necessarily wisdom, it's not necessarily depth. Okay, like, you've got enough books. You're gonna buy more though, aren't you? I, I totally fucking am. But like, when I speak about decadence, I don't say this like, I am not decadent anymore. Yeah, I'm decadent as a motherfucker. It runs down. Like, the reason I've come to this conclusion is because I was deep in decadence. You know, like deep, like some of the things I've done in my life, like, let's take addiction. So another thing you get in decadence is people that distract themselves with hedonism. So pleasure becomes the meaning of life because there's no meaning. Pleasure's not a great substitute, but at least it's something, right? At least it's like, well, I'm gonna die, and life means nothing, and there's suffering, but blowjobs are nice, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, okay, I get some just pleasure. I'm not against like pleasure. Yeah. Uh, less decadent societies have what we call wholesome pleasure. So wholesome pleasures are pleasures which d don't destroy you and aren't addictive. Make sense? I think Austria still has a degree of that, right? Like I saw people hiking yesterday with their families and. The, like, that's a wholesome pleasure. You didn't wake up this morning, I've got to get back to the mountains to do some hiking. You know? You didn't wake up going, oh, I've got a hangover from that hiking. I feel disgusting now. Right? So it's a wholesome pleasure. It's a pleasure that makes you stronger, a pleasure that makes you more connected to self, to nature, to others, to spirit. Right? So there's a, it's not like you have to take the fun out of life when you make some resistance to decadence. It's just you have to choose intelligent pleasure. Yeah? A wholesome pleasure. Okay? So less wholesome pleasure is addiction. Uh, it's distracting, and ultimately you always end up in despair. You see the amount of depression, you always end up anxious. Why are people anxious in the modern world? Why are people anxious? More anxiety than there's ever been. Decadent culture is always anxious. So there's a lot of input without much digestion and wisdom. Just so they're not regulated, so, that, so they're not co-regulated. You know, imagine someone who's in a village and they get upset and then they come back to the village and they have a ritual and they have a culture and they have meaning. We actually enacted this, I'm not training, maybe we'll do it later. And like they're held by that village. One of us has a problem, we're just on our own with our iPhone. You know, we're on our own with a piece of kit which is designed to make us more distracted, addicted, blah, 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 disconnected. Like it's monetized for that. That's not a conspiracy theory, that's its profit margin. Yeah, that's, you know, they even say, oh, this computer game is addictive. Okay, so people end up despairing because at a certain point they go, well, there's no support. I'm anxious because I'm not resting on the foundation of the land. I'm not resting on the foundation of the community. Of course you're anxious. Someone's anxious and we're like, do some yoga, bitch. It's like, you can't take away someone's connection to the planet, connection to other human beings, connection to themselves, and connection to spirit, and then say, do some fucking mindfulness. It's not, it's not enough. It's not strong enough. It's a band-aid on a fucking gaping wound, pouring blood. Like have this little sticking plaster. You know? Is this making sense? If the logic, you follow the logic, right? And this isn't to idealize the past. It's just to say in a decadent culture, it's going to be harder connect to connect to nature. Yeah? Because you're not working on a farm. You're not struggling with nature. Your life doesn't depend on if you, that harvest doesn't fail pretty fucking connected to nature when your kids starve to death if the crops don't grow, right? You don't have to have some pagan hippie philosophy. You're watching the ground for the green shoots in spring because you're hungry, yeah? You know, you're in touch with the seasons because that's what feeds you, okay? So it's, that's a different stage of civilization. We're in this, not just decadent, but electronic decadence. So that's new, the Romans didn't have that. The Romans had uh, distraction, they had, you know, uh, circuses, and they had uh, uh, pornography, you know. Porn wasn't quite the same then, though, was it? Like, it was like an etching of some hot Roman chick, you know? It's not quite the same as, like, you know, your teenage boys are looking at, like, hardcore threesome dwarf porn. You know, 20 different videos from around the world every night, you know? It's different from the Romans. So we have new problems as well as the same problems the Romans had with decades. Okay, let's take a breath, in case you've gone into despair, distraction, addiction already. Everyone's still okay? Mm -hmm. Notice the people around you, notice your own body. You can make some choices that are less decadent every moment, right? Good. Questions? Any clarifications? Yeah.
Yeah, so generational trauma disconnects people from their bodies, which also disconnects people from the land. So that's a, a confounding factor. Speeds it up, or? Uh, speeds up, I'd say it speeds up decadence, speed, speeds up behaviors of addiction like Gabo Mate's work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a separate topic, but they compound each other. So decadence makes trauma worse because you don't have support, you don't have the holding. Uh, and trauma makes decadence worse because you look more hedonistic, more addictive, more distraction, more despair. So, yeah, good, great question, actually. Confounding factors that work in both directions. There is, for example, if you read the Iliad, uh, Achilles gets trauma, okay? But it, so Achilles is, uh, some people say it's his lover, some people say it's his cousin, depending on the adaptation. Uh, Patrick Pacrilius, I'm not shit with Greek names. Anyway, his potential lover slash friend dies. Uh, and he gets trauma, he has PTSD response. Like, as a psychologist, you read the Iliad, and you're like, oh, that's PTSD. But he then has some rituals with the gods, he has a community, he's vigorous, he's in his body, he's not sitting at home masturbating to porn on his mobile phone, right? He's <laughs> fucking Achilles. So he's got like a whole meaning system that holds that and then he bounces back and does his thing. Yeah? So it's not like trauma doesn't exist in less decadent cultures, it just, um, uh, you're way more resilient to it. Way more. You still have an acute trauma response, but less of a chronic one. So what is there missing uh, now for people who have anxiety? Connection. So our theme is nature connection, so that's one of the four connections we're missing. Mm -hmm. But we're also missing embodiment, that's self-connection. Like, like in, a, in a more, in a different stage of civilization, there's no such thing as an embodiment teacher. It doesn't need to be. Imagine if I went to the sort of rural farm in Ireland and my great-grandparents said, I'd say, I'm here to teach your embodiment. They're like fucking potatoes. They're in the land. They're covered in mud. They're farming. They're fishing. They're like, what? Right? So the second disconnection is, you know, to ourself. Uh, nature we've already experienced. Particularly in modernity, which I'll come to, which the, again the Romans didn't have. This, you embody it quite a lot actually, this feeling of separation. This feeling, remember I was saying like, ew, yesterday. <laughs> that feeling of like, you, I put mud on my face and ate some mud and you were like, ew. Like, it's like, not quite <clears throat> of the lap. Yeah? You see my Irish family from back in the day and they're like, they're down. Yeah, often urban persons up here, you know, on their scooter? You know, drinking their soy latte on their scooter? You know, they're not, <sighs> yeah? So there's a different embodiment. Uh, the other disconnection is community. So for example, in Ukraine right now, you actually see very beautiful community. And you see, last one, a beautiful shared meaning. There's a narrative of what it means to be Ukrainian. There's a narrative of values. It's like, pe people say, oh, it's a conspiracy that they chose the Western way. No, it wasn't. They went, oh, that looks shit over there in Russia. How's Europe? Oh, that looks a bit nicer. Maybe we'll go over here. Do you mind? Oh, you do mind? Oh, shit, now we've got a problem. Like, they chose a culture. And there's also a love of Ukraine. Yeah? There's a, an unembarrassed love of the culture. Because they, they want to be part of the West. Ukraine and Russia have always been like on the edge of the West. It's like South America. It's the West and it's not the West. It's something else, right? So when I say the West, there's this kind of, there's a, there's a whole history to it that I won't get into. But it, it's mostly a set of ideas. So the West is an ethnic group. The West is a set of ideas like the rule of law and democracy and reason. It's, it's, uh, it's something um, you can be part of if you want to be, is how I look at it. Uh, particularly because individual choice is a key part of what it means to be Western. It's a key part of our ethic. Okay? You will have a Western ethic, by the way. You might not think you do, but it's like, if I, if I took you to an Arab country, or if I took you to Japan, you'd, you'd be like, ah, now I realize I have a Western ethic. If I said, like, Confucian ethic, if I said, right, you don't get a choice in what you want to do with your life, you were born into social caste, uh, and you have to do what your dad did. You'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> like, because individual choice and freedom is part of your ethic, whether you feel it is or not. Yeah, the right of the individual. Chinese don't believe in that. Chinese believe if it's bad for the group, fuck the individual. The Chinese have concentration camps today. Now, it's not that we've never had concentration camps in the West, but we find the idea disgusting. Right? We, we reassert the idea of the individual over the collective. We're not a collectivist culture. And that's for better and for worse. Yeah? So, the immature way to look at your culture is to say, it's the best. It's immature. A, a teenage way to look at your culture is to say, oh, it's really bad. 
It's like, fuck you, mum and dad. I don't want to be like you. Okay, mature way to look at your culture is, well, you know, I love my culture and it's good for this and it's good for that, but it has some downsides. Yeah, one of the downsides of the West is we're hyper-intellectual. Okay, so the West has embraced uh, cognition and reason. It's less in the body. So we're actually, you know, a, a typologically, not just through decadence, but through our type, a disembodied culture. Yeah? So this is the way so much kind of reason and intellectual stuff has come out of the West. That's a beautiful thing. But the downside of that is we're less in our bodies. Yeah, I remember uh, teaching uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to some of my friends there. Um, you know, I, when I talk about the West, I've lived elsewhere. So, you know, I have a comparison point. And I, I, my friend testified, right? I'd show him an Aikido move, you know, something complex, some, you know, quite complex move. And he'd just do it. I'd show him it once and he'd do it perfectly. I was just like, motherfucker. <laughs> and he was just in a much more body-based culture. He's learned like 50 different tribal dances from his youth, right? For him, it's like nothing to learn like keto moves. It would take like three months for one of us to learn. Yeah? It was really interesting, actually. It was just beautiful, beautiful. So his culture's maybe strong in another way, yeah? In a different way. It had that body awareness that for us is threat. Okay, so we've got uh, lack of just values and ethics, but ethics are also embodied. You see this, right? So um, it's like a Paul Linden thing. Um, you've got that bunny rabbit. Where's Mira? You've got that bunny rabbit? No, no I don't have the bunny rabbit. Okay. Okay. Hold up your hand. Okay. Imagine a really sweet baby bunny with a little cute nose and it's got big black eyes and it's looking at you. Okay. Everyone got the cute bunny? If you're allergic to bunnies, you can make it any other animal. Okay. And then I want you to strangle it to death. Okay, do you hear that noise? You don't, you don't have to stroke the bunny. We would never let the bunny go free. We would never kill the bunny. Do you hear that noise people made? Okay, that was a bodily contraction. Yeah? So ethics is built into your body. When we're numb from the body, we become cruel. And you'll see these cycles of numbness and violence in the Ukraine war, for example. Yeah? you see those cycles happening. So the ability to be present in the body is also an ethical thing. It's a value-based thing. This is why you may notice when you go to nature, you get in your body because nature helps that you relax, and then you go, what the fuck am I doing? What am I doing with my life? Why am I dating that idiot? Why am I doing that job? Why am I chasing this materialistic money? Oh my God, I need to simplify. You don't have that feeling in nature? Like, I need to simplify. I need to go back to my values. I, I just want to teach. I don't give a shit about money, whatever, whatever the materialistic thing is. Because the decadent culture has brainwashed you. And it's only when you come back to your own feeling, your own felt bodily sense, which nature helps with, you go, oh, I don't want to be decadent. I don't want to <laughs> fuck everyone. I don't want to snort all the coke in London. You go, ah, there's more to life, actually, and I want to simplify. And you're, you naturally become less decadent when you're in touch with your values, because they're your values, not decadent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more piece around this, around nature. Um, Decadence is not reproductive. So what you'll see in decadent societies is they just stop having kids. So decadent societies are suicidal societies. Yeah? So what they celebrate is everything non-reproductive. Okay? So it's not to say people have to have children. I don't have children myself yet. It's not to say that you know you can't have a gay couple who don't have kids. They might be great people, great members of society, but they're non-reproductive. So if everyone was gay, that would be the end of society, right? It's not making any individual bad or, you know, I don't have any religious belief against that or anything. But it is the end of society if no one has children. Are you with me? It doesn't have to be some big moral Christian kind of thing. Yeah? Um, and you'll notice, what are we celebrating right now? Anything non-reproductive. You know, it's like, you be a boss bitch, you go girl, you don't need to have kids. And that might be true for an individual, right? There's plenty of women who probably shouldn't have kids and it's not their life purpose. And actually, they'd be better off being a businesswoman in London. But I tell you what, I've coached a lot of women who are in their late 30s who wish they had kids, and now they're regretting having a career that actually wasn't satisfying. And now they're looking back on their life going, what the fuck did I do? Does this resonate with anyone? Women, tell me if I'm just being a sexist pig. I see a few hands going up. Yeah. <laughs> Resonates, right? You know these women in London and Berlin who are like, I don't need to have no kids. And then when they actually came back to their values, they're like, fuck. And now they're the wrong side of 35, and it's tricky. Like, that's a tragedy for those women. I've coached a lot of those women. And I used to be like, hey, you don't need to have kids, it's up to you. And that's true for a minority. There's always a minority 
you know, it's pretty cool to have a gay uncle, you know? It's like, it's pretty cool to have like one person in the tribe who's not having kids, so they're freed up to be creative, they're freed up to help other people's kids, you know? But like, that doesn't work if everyone's like that. Or the fact that I'm 43 and don't have kids, that's ridiculous. I could be, a, I could have an 18 year old kid, whatever. Quite easily, at 25, right? Is that math for no. I think it's 25. Okay, I could easily have met someone, like my granddad got married at 19 or whatever, right? Like I could easily have met someone and had like two or three like adult children. Essentially, I, I, we skipped a generation. Does that make sense? Because they have, you know. So we, we've become very non-reproductive and you'll see that chemically, like, you know, male testosterone levels are one quarter of what they were at my granddad's era. And that's when they started measuring them. Literally one quarter. You've got 25% as much dick as you could have had, ladies. It's very sad. <laughs> it's very sad. And that's, that's, that's a fact. You can look it up on the internet. And it's going down every year. It's going down every year. It's going down more. We don't know why. Maybe it's plastics. Maybe it's estrogen in the water. Maybe it's just society and decadence and culture, more of a cultural factor. Yeah? And there is a war on men in culture. Typically, in all decadent societies, Virile masculinity becomes, what's the latest word? Toxic. Toxic. Yeah. Okay. And you'll see this with the Romans. The Romans went from, you know, Pax Romana, we must conquer Europe, which has a bad side, particularly if you're the Celts, they're my people, they got massacred. Yeah. Um, that's the destructive first stage of civilization. Second stage is normally like, okay, let's stop murdering everyone, let's try and be civilized, let's have a philosophy. Third stage is don't be manly. So there's a, bit too, there's a war on femininity, which is don't be reproductive. Okay, somehow that's bad or wrong, even though it's like every culture in human history has worshipped the earth goddess. You know, that, you know the first piece of art that ever was? Big fat woman with big hips and big tits that everyone worshipped. That's the original goddess in every human culture around the planet. Fertility, right? So it's pretty hardwired into us. That's the feminine side. Masculine side was virility. It was the warrior, yeah? So cultures actually start really being negative on warrior culture. And then of course, what also happens in decadence is we see a swing back. We see a swing back where people then become, you know, kind of super macho. It's kind of like the Andrew Tate phenomenon. You know, they're like, ah, oh, you've got to be strong and tough. And it's, it's just like a stereotype of masculinity. Okay. So the danger of decadence is decadence itself, but it's also reactionary forces. So how did the Nazis come into power? Anyone know? Weimar Republic. I don't know what the Weimar Republic was. It was the super decadent liberal period in Germany before the Nazis. And it's a bit more complex than that historically, but that's the danger. Okay, so if you're left wing and you're like anti far right, you need to know about decadence. <laughs> because decadence is what produces that reactionary, it's called reactionary oikophobia. So there's two types of oikophobia. One is Western culture bad or being English bad, right? The other one is, oh, yeah, England's become corrupt and disgusting and decadent, therefore it's disgusting and bad. That's reactionary oikophobia. Yeah, neither of those is self-love. Everyone still with me? This is more theoretical than I normally go. Yes? What phobia? Weakophobia. It means self-hatred. Weak. O-I-K. Oh, it's from the from it's Greek. Like xenophobia, but it's in reverse. Yes, exactly. So they've, got zen so they've got two extremes, right? You've got, on one extreme is xenophobia, which is hating foreigners. On the other extreme, you've got weakophobia, which is hating yourself. Uh, and they're both, they're both sicknesses. They're both not helpful. Yeah, there's a healthy middle, which is like, ah, you know, with, the West is particularly prone to oikophobia because we're very self-reflective as a culture. Yeah, so we're, this is particular danger. Like, if you talk to an Arab or a Japanese person or a Persian or an Ethiopian, lots of cultures I admire, and I've spent time in those cultures, most of them, three or four. Um, they don't say, oh, Japan's terrible. They say, oh, we're very proud of our poets, and we have this samurai culture, and we have this in Japan, we love our technology, it's great. And they're really proud of it. And then they might say, you know what, but we're not perfect. But it's like an afterthought. You know, we're going to do an exercise in a bit where I'm going to ask you to say everything you love about your culture to someone, or your subset of Western culture in most cases. And you might find it really awkward, right? Like Churchill was a racist. It's like, for fuck's sake. It's like, yeah, everyone was a racist back then. But Churchill, Churchill's a mythological figure in British culture. It's like, if you hate Churchill, you hate yourself. It's, uh, there's always something through the lens of progressive experience. You can say, well, they didn't, because we're changing our values through decadence, you can always look back and hate history, right? And it's not to say that, you know, my family are Irish. I know the English have done bad things. We were the first colony that ever, we were the first European colony, basically, the Irish. 
So it's not that I'm not ignorant of the bad things done by European cultures. Far from it. You know, I've had family killed because of that essential colonization. Yeah. You know? Okay. So I just want you to reflect for a moment. Oh, excuse me. I want you to reflect for a moment about how you actually embody these things, because including me, we're not we're, we're not immune to it. Like, what are you addicted to? Where are you hedonistic? Where are you destructing? Where are you despairing? What, what rings for people? Let's kind of bring it home sugar. personally. Sugar! Who's a sugar addict? A little bit of that going on, yeah. <laughs> You'll see a change in cuisine as cultures get more decadent. Um, the Romans had celebrity chefs, okay? It's, it, one of the features of decadence is obsession with food. And it's not like meat and vegetables, good, wholesome, well, food, well cooked. It's, you know, very, it's like a quail inside a pig, inside a sheep, covered in syrup and sugar. And, you know, it's, it gets increasingly complex and increasingly pretentious. It's not meat and potatoes. It's not, you know, the Japanese equivalent of fish and rice or whatever, right? Yeah. So the complexity of food and the uh, less healthiness of food is a, is a feature of decadence. You'll see in, you know, the Persians eating some crazy ass food. Yeah. What else? What about this? Time. Measuring time and measuring things. Yeah, that, that's a very Western one as well, is the sort of, you know, the exactness of things. Um, this comes into modernity, which I'm going to talk about next, so just hold uh, that thought. Yeah. YouTube. Hmm? YouTube? Instagram. What's decadent about that? Because um, it's easy to just say anything new is decadent, right? It might be, but let's let's look. No, it's, it's not YouTube or Instagram itself, it's uh -huh. the way how you use it fast you get sucked into Okay, it. so the speed, there's yeah. also like, in, like more, 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 but there's also narcissism. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a key feature of, could be I've written up there actually, a key feature of decadence is, is me culture. Because if you're, in a traditional culture, you're in service to something, your country, your God, your tribe, your, you know, whatever it is. In a postmodern culture, there's nothing to be in service to. We're too cynical, right? Maybe your children. That's why, you know, people are so obsessed with their kids, right? But even then, it's my kids. Look at me and my kids. There's a narcissism. We were talking about this yesterday. There's a narcissism in that. You know? Also, Good. the fact that you're not, you're not chosen. It's, uh, you're nourished by uh, algorithm. someone else. Right, you're not actually nourished, right? I'd say I'm never nourished by the algorithm. <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't find the algorithm nourishing. No. Yeah, so lack of nourishment and explained with this sort of cheap, quick, like a sugary hit, sugary dopamine hit of pleasure as quick as I can. Yeah, because there isn't the deep satisfaction of connection. Fake sense of connection. Say again? A fake sense of connection. Yeah. Well. yeah, how many Facebook friends have you got versus how many friends can you call at three in the morning when you're crying? Mm -hmm. Right? Like if you've got five friends like that, that's great. You know, rather than 5,000 on Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's how many friends you've got. It's, it's like a home is the place where you can go and they can't turn you away. You know, I feel like that way about real friends. You can call them at three in the morning, wake them up, and you know, got a problem. Whew, give it a little wriggle, give it a little shake. There's a lot here, there's a lot here. Okay, so that's like the bad news. <laughs> it's quite a lot of bad news, isn't it? It's quite a lot of like facing the pain, but does it ring true? Is there some sense of like, I'm not lying to you? Yeah. Like, taste what I'm saying. Like, like, if I'm full of shit, you'll feel it, right? If I'm uh, technically in philosophy, it's known as bullshit. So bullshit's a technical philosophical term when someone's trying to sell you something. You know, when there's like, I know I'm lying, and you know I'm lying, but it's all bullshit. Like, you know, American culture, it's a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Advertising, a lot of bullshit. So if you taste the bullshit, reject what I'm saying. That's your, that's your embodied ethic. Okay, usually, don't people, usually people don't give you bad news as bullshit. They give you good news, or they give you bad news, and say, and now buy my solution. Um, so I don't really say there's a solution to buy, because I think this is really in us, uh, but we can come back to the four reconnections as a way to be less suffering from it. In body practice, community, which is the hardest one, I think, in decadent cultures, nature, which we've all been doing, that costs nothing, right? So it's like, you know, forest bathing, the Japanese call it. It's, it's funny, it's become a concept. It's not a concept. Go for a walk, you know, swim the lake, doesn't cost anything. Um, embodiment practice doesn't have to cost you anything. Community can take time and effort, and I think it's the most difficult. And then reconnecting to spirit and purpose, so you're less... It's harder to distract me, because I'm a man on a mission. Oh, you know, I have been for years. I'm fairly loyal to my sense of purpose, and that evolves over time. It's harder to buy me out. 
right? Uh, there's a nice video of Elon Musk talking to the BBC and he quotes the Princess Bride. And the guy in the Princess Bride is about, is about to kill the guy who killed his father. He's about to take his revenge on this guy who's gonna murder his family. And the guy said, and then the guy says, how can I, how can I, don't kill me, don't kill me. He says, offer me money. And the guy says, I'll give you all the money I have. He cuts him. He says, offer me power. He cuts him again, you know? It's like there's something about not being bought out because you believe in your purpose so much. Does that make sense? It's like something about having a value which is above, you're gonna get these nice things. Yeah, you're gonna get these nice things. And, you know, all religious teachers throughout history have understood that. You can't serve mammon and God would be the Christian version. Whew. Still got capacity for a little bit more theory? We, we maxed out. <laughs> Still good? Whew. Okay. So we also need to look at this, uh, this uh, decadence happens in cycles, that's true of all cultures, but we also have a progression through history. The West is not totally wrong, yeah? So in terms of being connected to the land, our main theme, imagine being in a tribal culture where you're living on the land, you're eating from that land, you've always lived in the same place, that lake and that valley we were in yesterday was your home forever, all the trees have names, the river has a name, the mountains have names, that's a very different sense of being connected to nature. We shouldn't idealize that because you've probably got like, you know, sky high infant mortality and ringworm. Yeah? Where's the cappuccino? You know? So I like I wouldn't want to idealize that, which is another thing Western people do. They have this uh, they or either orientalize the East or they idealize you know, Native American tribal culture. Yeah? But there is a you're 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 part of the land. So there's no sense of disconnection from the land, you're part of it. Yeah? So that's the last one in the West. Um, in the Middle Ages particularly, we invented what could be called traditional culture. So this is like monotheism, Judaism, Islam, uh, Christianity, etc., Hinduism. Uh, so this is the idea that there's a sky god, there's something bigger, there's a creed, um, but you'll still have a lot of purpose there. If you listen to people from the Middle Ages, they're very much enmeshed in this feeling of being in, in the West Christian. And you'll still hear that in like Islamic guys in London, for example. They'll still be in this traditional, I'm serving Allah, there is the Quran, you must follow the Quran. And the nice thing about that is you have a lot of uh, purpose. You have a lot of meaning. The, the bad side of that is, you know, jihads and crusades, genocides and things, right? Yeah, because you're so certain. The good side, however, is that you'll give, there's a strong sense of meaning. And the land is your steward of the land. So you're not quite of the land, like tribal situation, but it's still pretty important you look after it because God gave it to you. And you'll hear people say, you know, God gave us Israel, God gave us this, God gave us that. So it's pretty fucking important you look after it. Yes, you tend not to destroy it because it's still, it's, it's gone from one of us. Tribal is like the diffuse sense of your whole mind is about the land. It's, it's now a little bit separate, but it's still very much like a possession, but a possession from God. Yeah, so that's it's still a sacred quality to the land. And you hear in this tribal identity, you'll hear people have gone from truly tribal to uh, tribal in the sense of like, hey, we're British and this is our country. It might seem like super conservative viewed from kind of liberal embodiment, uh, you know, time we're in today. Um, please don't record sections of this because yeah. if the con is out of context, it's a really big problem. No, it's just a picture. Yeah. Can see the okay, no problem. So do you see how I have to be really careful? Because if someone just took a piss of this lecture, they say, "Oh, he's Nazi." Yeah. Right? He's saying that you should be tribal and have a national identity. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> okay. On well, a certain point in history, that was novel, right? You know, it was the nation state of England. So the German people were in the German country, or the, you know, the Spanish people in the Spanish country. So land and people were identical. It wasn't like, okay, this, Hungary is still like that. There's mostly Hungarians in Hungary. There's not mostly Londoners in London. You know what the indigenous population of London is as a percentage? Like Indians? white British? Indian? Indians? No, no, what, what percentage of London is now the indigenous people of the United Kingdom? Ah. Notice we don't even use the word indigenous, right? It's 30%. So London is 30% British. Like imagine going to Tokyo and it was 30% Japanese. <laughs> Japan is 99%. They're, they're an ethnic state, Japan. Yeah, Korea to a lesser extent. Yeah. Israel also. Um, so that's traditional view of the land, where the land is still pretty important because it's your land. Now if I said, Britain is the British people's land, now I'm from an Irish immigrant family, so that would be already a little bit, bit strange. 
Yeah? But that people would be like, you're a fucking racist, you're a Nazi, you're terrible. Because there's a link at this point between people and land. Now, you guys are Ukrainians living in Bali, right? Like, that's, who's living in a country that's not uh, their peoples? It's half the room. You're in Belgium, you're, you're in Asia. Belgium. You're in Belgium, you're Israeli, right? But anyone else? You're a German in Thailand. You're German and Austria. German and Austria. <laughs> yeah, same thing, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we got? <laughs> We're the first Corinthians. Yeah, what else? Uh, what else? No, but it is different. It is different. So, see, half the room and not where their people are from. So it makes sense. Like, I should be in Southern Ireland. I should be in Cork. That's where my people are from. Yeah? So when I say should, I mean in terms of connection to the land. Did anyone have that weird feel? Like, I, the first time I was in Cork, I was like, boom. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is the land. This is a this is a very taboo topic in Central Europe since about 1945. So if we talk about people's land, it gets very delicate. In Ukraine right now, it's a pretty fucking important issue, right? It's like people and land. It goes together. And of course, people move around, populations change, blah 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 blah. You know, we need to be a little bit cautious not to hold this too rigidly. Modernity. Modernity got rid of that. So modernity is this idea of the world becomes an object. The world becomes a resource. You've heard like fitness training is part of this as opposed to embodiment. A, 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 a tree is just timber waiting to happen. It's not a spirit. It's not part of God's creation. Get the difference? The tree here is a spirit. Here is a spirit. Now the tree is just a resource. It's an object. So the world has become objectified. The body has become objectified. That's fitness culture. That's where, this is where embodiment teachers start getting a job. Okay? So the bodies become objectified, the cultures become objectified. Like, why do you move there? Because it's convenient to make more money, right? It's like global capitalists are like, of course we can have mass immigration because, you know, we just need to keep the wages down. Like, we want to move people from here to here because there's a factory that needs workers, right? Then who gives a fuck about your tribal identity and your feeling of connection to the land? Fuck you, we just want workers. We want the cheapest workers we can get, right? Global capitalists fucking love immigration. Whether that's digital nomads or mass immigration to France, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm not snobby about which kind. It's not ethnic snobbery, it's, it's just, it's just money. Yeah? Keeps the house prices up and the wages down. Fucking ruling elites love that shit. It's just economics. So modernity is everything becomes an object. So at this point, nature connection is very difficult because it's an it. Yeah? At this point, it's a we. It's we, nature's animus, nature's personified. Okay, we were talking about this earlier, the animist view of the world, where the lake is a female, the tree is a, got a name, it's, it's part of your tribe. Yeah? That at this point is, is completely ridiculous. It becomes even more ridiculous in post-modernity. So this is where kind of objective breaks down. Now we go back to the sort of hyper-subjective. At this point, no one trusts anyone. Have you noticed that in the news? Everything's fake news, everything's a conspiracy. Is the conspiracy a conspiracy or is it actually not a conspiracy? Is it AI making a conspiracy or we all being, you know, manipulated by robots? Ah! Do you have that sense? Like, the last five years we're in the postmodern age. Obama, some people say, is the first postmodern president, right? And there's this feeling, does anyone have this feeling lately of, what the fuck is going on? Like, if aliens land on the White House lawn, I'd be like, I knew that would happen. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, fucking everything's mad now! And the reason it's mad is that you don't have any um, anchor. So in modernity, the anchor is rationality. The anchor is science, right? As soon as you have quantum physics, as soon as you have postmodernity, that's out of the window. Yeah? Uh, in traditional uh, culture, the anchor is God, the word of God. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite Germans, uh, Nietzsche. God is dead. As soon as God is dead, what the fuck do you do? So what did God is dead mean? It means there's no way to go from an it to an should. So in modernity, you only have objectivity, you only have it. You only have facts. Okay, you can never get from a fact to a value. So I said, killing children is wrong. Why? Uh, it just is. Right? It's like, there's no objective way. There's no logical way. In Socrates, realized, there's no Nietzsche was not really put it forward. So now we don't know what to do. So we have the postmodern confusion of, well, you just do whatever. And now we're in, de in decadent postmodernity. That's new. The Romans had decadence. They didn't have postmodernity. So we're utterly confused. The good, the true, and the beautiful break down. The good breaks down because you're like, what's right and wrong? There's no God to say, there's no religion to say, there's no country to say, right? But there's no spirits in the trees telling us what's right or wrong. 
We're not even our bodies aren't telling us to try to run because we're disconnected from them. Yeah. What's true is broken down. We don't know what we don't know who to trust. We don't trust the institutions, we don't trust science. Like I was just in CERN, right, in Switzerland, where they did the atomic stuff and the lift didn't work. And I thought, do I trust people with atomic physics who can't make the lift work? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not sure I trust science after you know Hiroshima. Yeah, after concentration camps. I'm not sure I trust science. Okay. So increasingly we don't trust media, we don't trust the truth, and beauty breaks down. Go to Salzburg, it's beautiful. The latest buildings built in Berlin, well, not so beautiful. Yeah? So we tend to see ugliness in how people dress, in how people behave, in buildings, architecture, etc. Yeah? So that's post-modernity. You guys not killed yourself yet? Still good? Okay, now I've got the good news. This is the good news, okay? So the good news is if we can survive this, we can have what's called metamodernity, sometimes called integral. This is the reintegration of these four sets of values. So this is where people can, like us, can go into the woods, we get a little bit tribal again, we can swim in the lake, can develop a relationship with the lake. We can actually have some traditional values where we say, you know what, maybe I won't fuck everyone. Maybe I won't do all the drugs. I tried a lot of them and some of them aren't very good. Yeah? We can develop, like in me, for example, I'm sober. 12 step, Alcoholics Anonymous, super traditional. There's 12 rules, it's like Christianity, right? There's steps and there's rules and there's rituals and structure. And at first I was like, fuck you! And then eventually I was like, okay, this is really good. Yeah? So that's what traditionalism looks like for me. It doesn't look like becoming a Christian, it could for you. I have friends just become an Orthodox Christian. For me, it means 12 step, for example. Yeah. It might mean uh, marriage for you. Uh, modernity, we can still have science, we can still have logic. If someone says black people are inferior, we can go, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. How did you come to that conclusion? Show me your studies. What's the genetics? What's the logic, right? We can still have this to offset this so we don't just become horrible fucking racists or whatever. Yeah? Um, we can still have some post modernity because post modernity is cool. Okay? We can still make ironic jokes, we can still watch pulp fiction, uh, you could have a polyamorous thruple with a dolphin if that viewer is so inclined. <laughs> Okay, so we can still have a little bit of chaos, a little bit of color, a little bit of magic, a little bit of weirdness, you know? Combining that all together is metamodernity, or it could be called integral. Uh, so that is the challenge we face ourselves. So when we're trying to connect to nature, that's what we've got to consider. Yeah, if we're trying to connect to nature, we might have to put aside a little bit of our modernity. We might have to embrace a little bit of our tribal or traditional. We might have to put aside a little bit of our postmodern cynicism. Yeah, but we can also look at it through the lens of you know, eco-regulation, modern terms. Yeah. Whew, it's a lot of theory. You guys look like that. Yeah. So um, let's stand up and move for a bit before we, before we take a break. Yeah.